Our scripture this morning is from Mark 1, beginning with verse 9 through verse 15. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. The spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals and the angels were ministering to him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Well, we begin a six week journey today in our uh, series of Lent called Lift Him Up, which is, is taken from uh, one of the three times that Jesus um, in the gospel of John said, something along the lines that if I'm lifted up that I will draw people to myself and of course the lifting up he was talking about the cross and the means by which he would die and it is his act of self-sacrifice upon which everything rests and our, our title today is cross-eyed and Jesus saw his life always through the cross and he also sees us through that cross and we find life when we live into that cross and look through that cross and it makes me think do you remember back in the 90s where they had those uh, 3d kind of posters that were the rage and um, you were told that you know it's kind of a boring looking image uh, like this but but you were told that if you would stare at it just the right way, maybe cross your eyes a little bit. That's what they always told me is cross your eyes, that there was a whole nother dimension back there. There was, a, there was, a, there was another world. It, this really wasn't the picture that you, that, that you were seeing on the, on the surface, but underneath, the, you know, there would be this, this beautiful meadow with a the, with the creek, and, and, and it was just paradise is what was behind that. And I'd stand in front of those, those things and I'd look and I'd stare and I'd cross my eyes, you know, and get dizzy. And I never did see any of it. Not once. Not, not even, you know. And it's like, you know, I just, I just want to come clean with that today. Uh, I thought about faking it back then, but I mean, I looked at least 20 of these things. And, and I, I, was, I was tempted to fake it and say, oh, man, that's fantastic. Wow, look at that. That's unbelievable, but I didn't, and I was always, you know, to be honest with you, always kind of suspicious of you people that said, oh, look at that, isn't that fantastic? I was like, there's nothing there. This is all some big hoax, you know. But it strikes me that seeing Jesus is uh, somewhat similar to that, you know. There is, there's more there than what we, we see on the surface. We, we might look at Jesus and, and not see his real identity. We might miss what he's really trying to show us. And, and this, lack, this lack of vision is solved by becoming what we would say is cross-eyed. We see things through the cross. Now, not in the sense of blurring our vision, but seeing this other dimension of what Jesus was bringing to us. And we find that it was to the cross that he lived. The cross was always there. It was always in front of him. When he says the time is fulfilled, it's leading to the cross. It would take three years to get there, but that's where he's going. And, and maybe there's something in the cross that, that we've missed. I mean, we, we might think of the cross, uh, the, the agony of the cross, or the sorrow of the cross, the, the isolation of Jesus on the cross, the sacrifice on the cross, and, and the forgiveness that comes to the cross, and all those things are too. But have we realized the, the magnetic attraction of the cross? that it's the cross that draws us to God. We're, we're drawn to God through the cross, in the cross. And I, I suspect that we still have a lot to learn here. I, I know I do. So our passage today is, is loaded with some extraordinary stuff. Um, first, Jesus is, 
is baptized. That's not something that Jews did. They had ritual cleansing, but, but baptism was for pagans, for Gentiles that were coming into the Jewish faith to enter into the covenant of Abraham. And yet John had been baptizing all sorts of people down by the Jordan River. And they would make their journey, you know, hundreds and hundreds of them from Jerusalem to make that, that trek. I think it's about 18 or 20 miles down there to the Jordan River. And the thing is, is that God was about to do something new. I mean, and they were ready. They were ready for something new. It, it had been 500 years since Israel had been anything. I mean, they, they had been uh, just conquered by so many different people, by the, the Egyptians and the Assyrians and, and, and the Babylonians and the Persians and then the Greeks and, and finally now the Romans at this time. So when John came, he says, God is doing something new. Get ready. Repent. I mean, they were ready. It was the end of the days, they thought. This is the time when God's going to set everything right. There's going to be a resurrection of the dead, they thought. And so we want to get on board with this. We want to get ready. And Jesus, at age 30 here, lays down his construction tools. You know, he takes off his car hearts, so to speak. And he makes the trip down from Galilee to Jordan. And he says to John, baptize me too. Now, something is about to change here you know and and the time is 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 now and and when when he's baptized a strange thing happens the sky is torn open i mean the division between between heaven where everything is right and earth where things are a mess is suddenly rent in two and opened up and and the holy spirit falls on jesus kind of dive bombs jesus in the form of a dove and then there's this voice, and the voice says, You are my own dear son. I am pleased with you. Imagine that. Jesus hasn't done anything. He hasn't done one miracle yet. He's just been baptized. This is at the beginning of his, of his, of his ministry. And before he does anything, he gets this affirmation from the Father. This is my son. This is who he is. And I'm pleased with him. And you see, what I think about that is that, is that God is cross-eyed too. Not in the sense, you know, God is always, always looking through the cross of Christ at us. Uh, God's affirmation of you is no different than this. But before you start cleaning your life up before you start reading your bible every day before you start having a prayer time before you start putting others before yourself before you stop doing that thing that you want to stop doing before you ever try to stop doing that god is giving you his approval oh not that he likes those things but he's saying you're mine okay yeah i, I vest you with my approval I, I, I love you the way that you are, you know. And God is pleased with you because God is looking through the cross of Christ to see you. God, God is cross-eyed as well. And, and that great gift where, where a man laid down his life for his friends is the lens through which God sees all of humanity and sees you. He does not see you as the one that has tried so many times and, and has failed. He, does, he doesn't see you as the one who just intends to do better but never does better. He sees you through the cross. Well, we, we don't earn the right and the identity of sons and daughters. God vests that with us. He, he, he says that up front. I, I'm pleased with you. Can you receive that today? You know, tell me, parents, are, are, are you pleased with your newborn child? Do you take that newborn child and say, well, his hair could have been a little longer, a little darker, I, you know. Yeah. She could have been a little taller, a little longer. Look at her ears. I don't know. No. What would you change about them? Well, what would you change about this imperfect child that God has given you? Not a thing, would you? 
You see, you vest your love in them before they ever do anything. And you know that there's going to come a time when they're two or three years old, and it's, it's going to get a little bumpy, and then it's going to get kind of bumpy again about, you know, 12, 13, and it might get really bumpy, you know, 18, 19, who knows. But <laughs> that, that, that doesn't make any difference. You've, you vest your love in them from the beginning, and that is what God does with you through the cross. That's how he gets to you. So Jesus receives this identity as the Son of God and the affirmation from heaven before he does anything. And that's how he begins his ministry. And then he's led by the Spirit out into the wilderness, out there with the beasts and the angels for the time of testing. Oh, and Satan, too. And who he is, you know, this, this affirmation of God, this identity, you are my son, is then tested out there in the wilderness for those 40 days. And, you know, what God said from heaven is true. Uh, he is the son of God. I mean, do you all see that? Can, can you see who he is? And then, then he begins to preach. And he returns to Galilee and he brings them the gospel, the good news. And he says, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom is at hand. What a simple message. The kingdom is at hand. So simple. Or is it? You know, Jesus said more about the kingdom of God than any other subject. He, he referred to himself, remember, as the son of man. That's this figure out of the book of Daniel that's going to bring about this new kingdom that's going to set things straight. But I think that we Americans have uh, kind of a, an odd opinion of the kingdom of God. I'm going to stop right there. We Americans have a rather strange opinion. We're, we're at a disadvantage when it comes to kings and kingdoms. A at best... I think our, our idea of royalty is that royalty, that they are um, rich, um, slightly incompetent, kind of snobby, and, and out of touch. You know, that's what we think of royalty. On the game show The Family Feud, uh, Steve Harvey, great, great guy, contestants are asked to guess how 100 people responded to various survey questions course, you, you know the drill, and on a 2012 episode, a contestant had to provide the top answers to the survey question, when someone mentions the king, who do you say, who might he or she be referring? The top four answers, 81 people said Elvis Presley, 81 out of 100 people said Elvis Presley, seven people said God or Jesus, three people said Martin Luther King, and two people said the Burger King. Now, LeBron didn't even make the survey. <laughs> I, I kind of like that, don't you? So, but seven people answered uh, God or Jesus. See, we have some difficulty understanding what Jesus is saying when he says, I'm the king and I bring a new kingdom. The kingdom of God is here. And yet, that's how he describes himself and his mission over and over. He's the king bringing in a new kingdom. And it's a different kind of kingdom than anyone had ever known. This kingdom is, remember, the one where the, the least is the greatest and the last is first. The weakest is the strongest. It's an upside-down kind of kingdom. It's like opposite day, forever, is what he's saying. And although Jesus is born into a noble family, into the family of David, he doesn't act much like a king. Although he is called a king by, by angels and by, by wise men from another, from a Gentile nation that traveled to see him, he's, his reign doesn't look like other kings. Remember that he would die with the title above his head, and mocking him that says king of the Jews. And so, so maybe we shouldn't feel so bad when we kind of miss this when we hear the kingdom of God and we go, oh, what, I don't know, what, what, what is that? Or, or king, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not so sure. Because those who witnessed his works, those who were there, whew, man, for the most part, they missed what this kingdom was. 
I think the most accurate way to describe the, the kingdom of God is to say that it's heaven on earth. God rips open the sky. And, and it wouldn't be the last time that that's done. And to say, in essence, that this barrier between the perfect world of heaven, where there is no sin, and this messed up place that we call the earth, the world, that that barrier has been broken and that God is invading this world. And there would be an invasion of the kingdom of God into the kingdom of this world. And it would be heaven on earth. Author and, and Professor Lewis Smeads asked his students if they wanted to go to heaven if they died. And of course, everybody raises their hands. They all want to go to heaven. And then he, the next question is, would you like to go today? Well, uh, a few of them, of the more you know, openly religious, well, yeah, they thought the right answer has to be today, so I can't put my hand down. So everybody else, they put their hand down. And Professor Smeads, he asks, you know, who then would like to see this world set straight, you know, for once and for all of eternity. Who would like to see this earth become a perfect place? No more common colds, no more uncommon cancers. Hungry people would be fed. There would be no more greed. There would be no more hate, no more war. Anybody interested in that? Yes. And every hand shoots up. And then Smeads would point out that if that new world is what they really want, then heaven's where you'd like to be. And we, we might say, well, yes, well, why, why didn't you just say so? You know, I, I'd like to be a part of that kingdom too. And that day, as he, as he walked about Galilee preaching the gospel, the good news, the, the gospel that he preached was that the king and the kingdom of God is here now. It's among you. The time is now. You don't have to wait any longer. It's not someday that this is going to happen, he says, but it's here. The time is fulfilled. Oh, but there's more. He said, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe. Jesus spoke of those two important actions, repent and and we believe, and he spoke of them together. I think generally we want to, to separate those. A common error is to repent or is to separate repentance from faith, when in reality they are brothers or sisters, and, and you can't separate them. Uh, so often they are together in the Bible. It, it takes faith to repent, and when we repent, we have more faith. But generally speaking, we hear repent and we think remorse. We think, I messed up. I got caught. I'm ashamed. I got to change something because, man, you know, I got busted is what happened. And that's, that's not all that it means. We hear people say, repent. You're a sinner. You know, they, they stand up on boxes and scream that in bullhorns. You're sinners. Why, like, tell us something that we don't know. Tell us something that we're not aware of. Everybody has a general knowledge that we're sinners, that there's something wrong. There's so much more here. And as you know, the Greek word for repent is metanoia. It means to change one's mind or to simply change. Of course, all change begins with the mind. It, it begins with the mind. It's kind of like stop pretending as if God has not come and invaded this planet in the person of Jesus Christ. I think that's what Jesus is saying there that day. Stop pretending that your life is all about you. I mean, because when you realize that, that God's new kingdom starts now, it changes the way that we live. Okay, if it's just about heaven some other day, we put it off. But if it's now, it changes today. Repent is good news for us. It's not, God is here and man, you're in trouble. You know, now, now he, he sent somebody and, and he's, he's checking you. You know, he's going to find out who, who doesn't measure up. No, the good news is the kingdom is now. 
So your life is going to change. It's going to be different. Believe that, Jesus says. I think the, the call to repent is very positive. Repent and believe. Jesus not, is not saying, change your ways and I might take you with me. I might love you. I might even die for you if you're good enough and you change your ways. He's not saying, he's not saying you're good the way you are. You, you, must, you must change to be acceptable. He's saying, turn from the kingdom of this world toward this new life, this new kingdom. See, we, we, we turn to his kingdom and he does the rest. It's, it's not about us. Sometimes it's slow. Sometimes it takes a long time. Okay? It's not fast. But it begins now is when it begins. There's a guy that evidently lives close to me in my subdivision, and he drives an SUV. And I've seen him multiple times. So I get, you know, behind him as we're waiting to get on the big road. And he's got all this Florida Gator stuff on the back of his SUV. Maybe you've seen this. I don't know. It's, it's, it's just terrible. I just can't admit, you know. He's got SU, he's got Florida Gator stickers, and he's got a, you know, his license plate. He's got a Florida Gator light. Any place, that, anything he could have on his car to make a Florida Gator, he's got Florida Gator on it. And I noticed the other day that he's got a Kentucky license plate. So it's like, you know, you see somebody driving around like that, and you think, well, they're just kind of lost. You know, they ended up in Kentucky, and, may, you know, maybe they're on vacation or something. But no, this guy's a resident. He lives here. He lives here, and he's driving around with that Florida stuff because obviously, you know, we're joking about this, but obviously, you know, there was a time when he probably went to Florida and to school, and he was a resident there, and he's got great memories, and it was raw, raw team and all that stuff the way that we are for our team and then he moved here to Kentucky and so he has great memories and he and he has you know uh, still strong ties to Florida so he wants to keep that on his car but I imagine every time I see him I think you know I wonder how long he's been here a year or two you know at the most and I have in my mind this time where where he's going to be maybe it'll be some Friday afternoon out at Keeneland when you know it's about 65 degrees and all the beautiful people are there and everybody's gorgeous, as they say, and, and he's just having a great time. And maybe it'll be then that he becomes a bluegrass resident of Kentucky and I. You know, or, or maybe, maybe, you know, he'll make it to the Derby or, uh, and there he'll be converted, you know, that final step into being a resident here in Kentucky. Or may, maybe a neighbor, you know, somebody might drag him down to Rupp sometime and he might watch a game Maybe the Gators are in town, and at the end of the game, when everybody locks arms and sings "My Old Kentucky Home," he might get a little something in his eye, and you know, maybe maybe that's my dream for him. Uh, he, he might be driving on the back roads of Kentucky sometime, and finally, you know, the, the rest of the change happens. And as he gets his new car, he won't, you know, order that stuff. To put on his new car, but he'll just, you know, fully be in the bluegrass. I think that's how it is with the kingdom of God. We come to Christ and the kingdom of God becomes our new home, but the kingdom of this world, still, we still have some allegiances and, and we still think we're, we're not totally changed over. And it's, it's not easy to leave that. The, the great challenge of the Christian is to overcome divided loyalties and for our minds to be transformed okay so that we see really what the reality is and to do that we have to look through the cross now the opposite of repent and believe i mean there, there's an alternative to repenting and believing in the gospel it's there's actually an alternative that has become uh, increasingly more popular and the alternative to repent and believe, which, you know, repent, which means to change and change your life, the alternative is just to stay the way that you are, to never change anything. The alternative to believing that God's good news is coming now is to think, you know, you know, this world's never changed and people don't change and it's never going to change and I'm sorry, I'm just, 
It's just not. It's just not going to change. You know, there's days when I live like that. Thankfully, it's not weeks and months, but there's days that I live like that. Sometimes I get kind of sucked into a, a black hole. It is the only way that I can uh, describe it. It's a black hole of kind of despair and criticism. And something happens, and I just get sucked into the mind frame that, of the God of this world and the one who has deceived this world into living as if Jesus has changed nothing. And he convinces us that, that we cannot change. He convinces us that the world is, is just a terrible place and everyone who looks happy is really faking it. And catch this. Of course, it's getting worse and worse. Oh, yes, it's getting so much worse. Things are getting worse. The, the guy cuts you off in track, traffic, and all of a sudden now everybody that's driving on the, on the road is a jerk. You know what I mean? You know, one, one guy cuts you off, cuts me off, and all of a sudden I'm thinking everybody that's driving here, they're all jerks. How, how quickly we jump to that, Right? And sometimes I get sucked into that hole that, that I see that everything is just getting worse and worse and it's never going to change and it's just, it's just hopeless, you know. And he shows us those things of scandals in governments and, and ISIS and immorality on the rise and on and on. And we, we notice those things and the deceiver of this world shows us the examples of why things aren't changing. And it, we... You know, now, in our right minds, we know that that's a lie. We really do. We know that that's a lie. But it's an effective lie, isn't it? And what we fail to see is how the kingdom of God, which Jesus called people to join, is really growing. It is. You see that phrase that's used so often in conjunction with the kingdom of God is that it is without end, is what is said. All the other kingdoms of this world are going to come to this end, but this kingdom will never have an end. It grows and it grows and it grows. And sometimes the growth is very slow and it's difficult for us to see. But it's heaven on earth. Some days it's difficult and that's why we have to, to look through the cross. We have to use that lens that God, hear me, God is redeeming this world through you. You are the one that he is using to redeem this world. And Jesus walks into our lives and he says, The time is fulfilled. I brought the kingdom to you. Repent and believe the gospel. When we live in the kingdom, we live in the cross. And Christ is lifted up. And when Christ is lifted up, he draws people to himself. He does the drawing. We do the living. But when we live in the cross, when we live in the kingdom, when we put God first, others next, and ourselves last, God draws people to himself. Are you ready to believe that? You know, I want to challenge you. We've gotten off to kind of a rough start of Lent. We missed our Wednesday night service. But I want to challenge you, whether you're, you're listening to this at home or, or, or whether uh, in person, I want to challenge you that sometime today, don't do, it, don't do it tomorrow, do it today, sometime today that you would put your phone away, put your pad away, turn off the TV, take some time for you and God. Oh, it doesn't need to be a prayer for all the, the people in the world. That's not what I'm talking about. What I want you to, what I challenge you, really, to, to ask God in prayer. Just take some time, just you and God, and ask him this question. Lord, where is it in my life that you want access? Where is it in my life, Lord, that you want access you know, in other words, along the lines of this sermon, what, what part of the kingdom of this world am I still holding on to so much that I won't let you in so you can change me in this? Where, do you, where, where am I blocking you in my life? Where do you want access? Think you could do that? I want to challenge you to do that. Okay. 
it, God, God will speak to you. God, God will give you specifics about where that is. And then, of course, it's up to you to, to follow to make that step. Amen.